welcome everybody welcome to the legendarium podcast this is i i honestly have no idea i know sometimes it's a bit i do i don't know what episode number this is but we're talking about terran wanderer this is book four in the perdane chronicles um i am craig your host welcome everyone and over there if i were a blacksmith i'd pound him in my forge it's ryan bruckman <laughs> let's chalk that up to phrases that we will never say again <laughs> just bleep that whole thing <laughs> And uh, I don't know, something about pottery and wheels and time. And I don't know. I mean, it's Kyle Lemon. I'm just grateful that I'm. there is no pounding happening on my end. <laughs> I don't know. I'd throw you down on that wheel. So yeah. I don't know, something, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, we are talking about Terran Wanderer. And despite the um, stupidly uh, adult yet juvenile jokes at the beginning of the episode, we are talking about a children's series today. So... Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we I, need to go on the same journey that Taryn goes on in this the, story. Maybe I need to go. I do need to bleep that. So whatever. Nah, uh, leave it. <laughs> if if somebody's listening to this episode, they know exactly what, what they're, they're getting, getting with this yeah. crew. So it's the fourth episode. It's your fault, listener. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> before we get started, I do want to say, um, you know, all the regular things go to thelegendarium.com. There you can find links to Discord. Please join in the discussion. It's so much fun. Uh, we get uh, new people in the Discord server, I, I think, daily at this point. We're well over a thousand people, um, and yet it maintains its status as the nicest place online, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you can also find links to Patreon if you want to do a recurring tip jar donation, which we really appreciate. You can find that there at thelegendarium.com. But you can also, if you click on the support button, find links for one-time donations. If you, you know, if if the dip, tip jar, if you're just walking by the tip jar and you're not going to hang out at it, give again and again. If you just want to do a one-time thing, you can do that there as well. Then uh, the last thing I'll mention is YouTube. I'm only mentioning this because it's on my mind. I just released another, uh, another episode today uh, on, or another episode. I, I re released another video on YouTube today, so it's on my mind. Please go subscribe. Um, I have a lot of fun with it. You guys should see the chart, by the way. Um, I, I looked up our all time YouTube subscriber chart and mm -hmm. I, I started doing videos, not regularly, but I just made some videos this year and the, the subscriber chart, the views chart just goes crazy. You know, it's, uh, it compared to what we were doing when we did nothing. God so. bless bot farms. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Russia. I feel like you should, you should draw some like lines on your shirt and as your hair gets longer it's like this is 4k subscribers this is 5k <laughs> subscribers <laughs> and it's just it. the length of your hair yeah it'll be great now we're talking hey i kind of like that yeah uh i i was surprised no comments about my hair on so far on this particular video um i can't say that about my other youtube channel where what I... you should do for your youtube intro is have the nicholas cage like fan blowing oh, in yeah. your hair that should be part like that should be a segment for you too. Just your opening <laughs> credit will be a Con Air, just, just nice light. The, good, the good yeah, the theme from Con Air. Yeah, exactly. no, I, I think that's a fantastic idea, frankly. <laughs> um, okay, well maybe we should talk. Speaking of fantastic, maybe we should talk about this fantasy book, Terran yes. Wanderer, uh, book four in the Perdane Chronicles. Now I had told you guys previously that this was this was my the book I was looking forward to the most, um, the cream of the crop as far as I'm concerned, uh, just because. I, it's been a while since I read it. I think I read it when I was 19. Previous to that, I'd read it when I was, you know, probably like nine years old, eight years old, something like that. I'd read it when I was 12. Um, but in my adult life, uh, not much, right? But my memory, as memory served, I was like, you know, I think I'm going to really like this as an adult. Uh, for me, it did not disappoint. What about you guys? We'll just get thoughts real quick and then we'll do a recap. What, what did you guys like the book? Yes. Uh, I think I fall into a very similar category um, in the setup where reading this as a kid, I remember this being the book that I felt was boring. There just wasn't a whole lot. There wasn't quite the same level of adventure or anything. But this time, it definitely it struck a different chord with me, and it's it's a much it's a much better book as an adult, quite frankly. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. Kyle, what about you? Yeah, I I haven't read this before, so I don't have memories of did I like it, did I not? But I really enjoyed it from a journey of self-discovery um that it was deeper than i thought it would be especially for a children's book it was like yeah. oh there's some there's some stuff there's a lot of stuff in this and i think we're going to get to a lot of that but but speaking of the it's not uh it, ryan you're saying it's not the same kind of adventure not the same kind of uh thing that we've been dealing with in the previous books it does have the series first 
or I don't know about first, but certainly best blow by blow fight scene where he, he's had fight scenes and battle scenes before, but they're really quick. He kind of skims over them. Mm -hmm. um, and in this one, when Taryn uh, is fighting Dorath in the woods, um, you know, their, their first encounter and Taryn fights Dorath. Okay, yeah. It's actually a really good, effective fight scene. I was impressed because he hadn't done that before. So uh, it does have some of that uh, it, well, stuff. Uh, up to this point, there, there have been action sequences, but Terran hasn't fought a whole lot in right. the prior books. This is one of the few times where he's now come of age enough and is now competent enough that drawing a sword and going to battle against Dorath a little bit is more feasible, whereas in book one, like, he should be killed immediately. <laughs> right. Like, it's, it's, we believe that it could happen now based on his past adventures. Yeah. Anyway, I was just, I, when I got to that scene and I, I was kind of in the middle of it and I realized like, oh man, I'm really enjoying this. Wow. He did a fight scene really well. But maybe I should recap the rest of the book. Yes. Unpreparedly. Uh, so yeah, this is an unprepared recap. We'll see how it goes. But basically, Terran Wanderer, as you say, Ryan, this is a, a very different kind of adventure. At the beginning of the book, Terran goes to Dalbin, uh, his father figure, and says, hey, look, I... I love Ilanwi. Uh, finally, I can admit it. Uh, and I want to ask for her hand in marriage, but I can't do that unless I know who I am. I don't know who my parents are. I don't know what my lineage is. I don't know what my station in life is, right? This is a society that worries about that sort of thing. Um, I don't know what my station is. And until I do, I can't, in good conscience, ask for her hand in marriage. So I'm going to go. First, I guess he asks, who are my parents? And Dalbin's like, yeah, you're going to have to figure that out for yourself. So he, so he goes on a quest. He says, fine, I'm out of here. Gurgi goes with him. They go to the marshes of Morva. They go to the, uh, the Cantrevs, the, the, whatever they're called, the Valley Cantrevs, um, with King Smoit and all that. They go to the, the hill, the, the, the free Kamats in the hill Cantrevs, and the, et cetera, et cetera. They go everywhere, all over the place. Every chapter is a new location. They battle a wizard. They, save a cow they you know he <laughs> learns uh, several different trades um he's deceived by a man who uh tells him that that he's Taryn's father um and Taryn lives with him for a time believing that this may be his father and and you know kind of the psychological work that that does on him um and anyway so he goes everywhere and at the end of the story he, he's on a quest to to find the mirror of lunette this magical mirror that's supposed to tell him who he really is then he goes on this whole quest and in the last five pages of the book he comes across the mirror looks in the mirror and sees himself and only himself it turns out it's just a puddle of water in a cave mm -hmm. and it's you know it's, uh, people have told stories about it you know uh but it's just a puddle of water in a cave he looks in it sees himself and comes to lots of realizations about who he is and who he has become and who he might be in the future uh but it's all non-magical it's all internal um realizations and then he beats up a bad guy and the book is over <laughs> right mm -hmm. so yeah. but within that like we were saying earlier this book is packed with stuff and we were kind of talking about this before the mics were turned on about it, it, like every chapter every single moment it's another life lesson and uh, we we've talked in previous episodes about how economical uh, Lloyd Alexander is with his writing, like how how he's able to pack these really kind of dense and fun adventures into, uh, you know, 175 pages. And now we have the same kind of thing, but it's even more. Uh, from from my adult perspective now, I feel like it's just uh, unbelievably stacked with cool stuff. What about you guys? This is the story is really uh, different in its initial questing. Like the the previous books, we've all had. Uh, the MacGuffin, we've had the item that has been stolen or the thing that has disappeared or whatever that has driven us. This is all driven by that internal need to know who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, admittedly for his desire to marry Islandwe, but that's one of the things, this is, not, this is not new ground that's being broken or anything, but the fact is, is that uh, I, I love this trope, I love or theme or whatever you want to call it of uh, there's an item at the end that's going to tell you who you are. You know, the great mirror, uh, mm -hmm. in this case, the mirror of Lunette, you know, mirror of Verised and Harry Potter, whatever, like, whatever, you'll see something in this that will tell you your future. But 
it's the lessons that are picked up along the way that make you realize who you are. And I think that this is such a unique approach and a great way of helping us kids, especially as they're reading this, learn that lesson that there is a lot in the journey more so than in the destination to figuring out what you want to be or who you mm -hmm. are and things like that. And that's, that is a really key lesson to this story. And it's a really difficult thing for, uh, for youth to understand, especially, you know, when they may not be as patient or they may even want, you know, to understand things now or whatever, but figuring out who you are takes time and it's all based on experience and how you react to things. And yeah, it's, it's impressive to, to write it this way. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that Taryn had a few, had a few chances along the way to potentially get that goal of being able to marry Alonwi, where it was like, I need to be a no, I need to be a noble in order to marry a princess. Right. And he had a chance to do that. When King Smoy offered, yeah. offered to make him his heir. And I really appreciate that his choice wasn't to take that kind of easy way out. I mean, easy way he did a lot of things to, to <laughs> sure. accomplish that but that it really was a journey of self-discovery for Taryn and for himself rather than a journey of self-discovery for this end goal in mind of marrying Elanwi because I think that had he done that he could have quote unquote qualified as a noble to to be able to marry her and that would have happened but he still would have wanted to know where he comes from and who he is and so mm. i really like the way that this was laid out that he made those choices i mean he had several choices like, to your point he he learned several trades he could have been a noble he obviously has built up his ability in combat so like there are paths that he can take and i think that he doesn't come to that realization until he looks in the mirror and just sees himself and realizes wow here's all the things that i've become and things that i can do not because of who I who who my parents are or who I who I was born to be. It's because who I've made myself into through my experiences. Right. It, that's a really great point. And how many how many dozens, hundreds of uh, pop psychology or self help books have we seen over the years where the the idea behind it is? And I I, I make fun saying pop psychology. I don't mean to, but. Uh, but the idea is before you can truly love someone else, before you can give yourself to them, you need to know who you are. <laughs> you know, you need to be in possession of yourself before you can uh, give yourself to another. Um, and that's kind of, I think, what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you you could go ahead and marry Ilanwi, you know, as the the king of the what of the Valley Cantrevs. Mm -hmm. um, but is that? But is that going to work? Is that uh, is that really what you're after? And no, the answer is no. That's not what you're after. And yeah, that's something we talk about constantly. I guess my point is like everywhere in uh, in pop culture and social media and everywhere we hear this idea that you need to know yourself. You need to understand yourself before you can uh, before you you must love yourself before you can love others or others can love you. Whatever you're getting you know? this very neo oracle conversation. <laughs> know thyself, neo. You know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. So where where do we want to go now? Um, oh, I will say this. Uh, there's similar to the last few books. I've talked about how, uh, like the in the the Black Cauldron, the Marshes of Morva scene was the thing that stuck out in my mind. Um, but it was only a chapter long. Uh, same thing with the uh, Glue's Cavern in the Castle of Lear. And now in this one, we've got a couple. There are a couple of these that stick out really, really prominently in my memory of this book. But it turns out they're very short. Every episode in this book is very short. Um, but the first one I'm thinking of is the uh, the confrontation with Morda. The enchanter. En enchanter? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wizard? The wizard. Whatever we want to call him. Um, where in my mind it's like, this is a giant central set piece in the book uh, because it was exciting, you know, to <laughs> Ryan's point, this is not the most few action sequences, right? Yeah. And this is, yeah, this is one of the few action sequences. Um, uh, but as I was reading it this time, of course, coming at it in my mid thirties, it's going to be different than when I'm nine, right? When I'm nine, <laughs> I'm like, something's happening. Wow. You know, wow, <laughs> magic and oh, he's turning them into animals and all this stuff. Um, 
but uh, but it hit me really, really differently this time. So just to bring people up to speed in case it's been a while since they, they read the book or they, they didn't read the book, uh, they come across this enchanter, Morda, um, and he has these grand designs to rule mankind through this magical object that used to belong to Ilanwi's family. Doesn't really matter. Whatever. There's a magical object. He's going to use it to rule the world. Um, and he's turning the companions into animals. He's about to turn Terran into an animal. Uh, Terran goes to kill him. He thrusts his sword through his chest and Morda doesn't die. He laughs it off. What is going on? And it turns out that he has poured his life essence into a bone from his pinky finger. Uh, and by literary happenstance, <laughs> they came across this bone, you know, earlier in the previous chapter, right? Uh, it's one of the many, 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 many conveniences in these stories, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we forget that. Uh, it's no problem. Um, anyway, and, and so, yeah, it, Taren breaks the bone and uh, kills Morda and the companions are restored to their human selves. And it's all, it's, it's all if heroic Voldemort and triumph. Voldemort stopped at one. What's that? If Voldemort had stopped yeah. at one, this First, is yeah. how the story would have gone. <laughs> exactly. And even when, when he wrote this, this I, I don't re recall what year this was. It would have been sometime in the 60s or the early 70s, maybe. Um, it, Lloyd Alexander even wrote, he's like, look, a lot of this stuff ain't new. I didn't make yeah. up the idea of this guy pouring his life essence into a thing. You know, mm -hmm. and who knows? Maybe he was thinking of the One Ring. I, but that's, it's older than that. It's, it, Tolkien didn't make it up, you know. Um, but anyway. Uh, yeah, Terran snaps this guy's pinky finger and kills him. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, as I'm reading this in my mid 30s, it it occurred to me that um, that Morta had you know he'd poured his entire life into this one tiny little thing um, and thought you know that is gonna it's gonna allow me to rule the world. Um, and when that single thing, when that one thing was threatened, he freaked out. You guys remember this? Like he's, uh, Taryn holds up the shard, the bone shard, mm -hmm. and Morda is literally groveling on the floor. Don't do it. Please, I'll do anything. You can have the jewel. I'll teach you all my magic. Just don't break that bone. I'll do anything. Whatever. He's literally groveling. Um, and it, it, it's a very adult lesson that it took me until I was 35 to pick up, and that's diversify. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. And it, now, okay, yeah, you hear this all the time from your financial advisor or whatever. I'm sure you all have a financial advisor because, uh, no, never mind. Uh, but you, you hear this thing, diversify, but it's more than just your finances. It's a psychological concept as well, where if you pour everything of your entire life into one tiny thing, whether it's a person or an activity, you know, maybe it's a hobby, maybe it's your profession, maybe it's whatever. But if you pour your entire life essence into one single thing, and that one thing gets threatened, you're screwed, right? So Sauron, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, so you know. So if you if all you've ever cared about is your job, and that's the only thing that you give yourself psychologically or emotionally to, and then you get laid off, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. You know, it, maybe it's uh, it's a relationship and. Uh, I, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying don't, uh, <laughs> I'm not don't saying invest in your relationships. You heard it here first on the legendary folks. <laughs> I'm not saying don't invest <laughs> in your relationships. Surface levels only. But Diversify you... your relationships, <laughs> multiple <laughs> intimate relationships. No, I'm just saying like if, um, if that one person is everything in your life and there's nothing else to you and then that relationship uh, goes south for whatever reason. Um, you know, doesn't exist anymore for whatever reason. What are you going to do? Anyway, I, 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 this book hits different at 35. You know what I mean? So anyway, I've been monologuing for a long time. What, what about you guys? What, um, what episodes jumped out in your memory? What, what did you really enjoy? Um, one of his early, earlier adventure pieces is, uh, getting to pass judgment on two kings, uh, whose names, uh, it's like Gorvin and Garth or something. <laughs> I totally uh, am spacing it at the moment. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, Two lords under King Smoit. Yeah. And they... Gast and Gorion. Thank you. Yes! Gast and Gorion. I can't believe I pulled that out. That was um, amazing. Each one of them believes themselves to be more of an attribute than they actually are uh, in terms of like kindness or, you know... Courageous. Like, courageous, kindness, things like that. And uh, basically they end up 
uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how they, it, they end up where they have damaged, they're going to go to battle against one another and they have destroyed this farm and Smoit uh, and Terran go out to stop them and Smoit turns to Terran and asks him to help pass judgment on this. What do we do with this? And one of the first signs of Terran's growth into full adult is so like, instead of, you know, make them pay for it or whatever, it was make them work the land with him. Mm. Make them fix it. Fix the farm. Fix the farm themselves. They have to do that. And again, as a as a kid, it's like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's... He figured it he out. Figured he it out. solved the puzzle. Good. As an adult, though, that that lesson there of you don't truly understand or the ch you will not affect change in another person well enough until they have had to empathize and be with that person and go through that things like that is an incredibly deep judgment to pass that's really impressive for anybody at any age let alone Taryn in this this in this time period in his life uh which actually this total side note here this is the longest timeline of any of the books by like, far in, in fact i think this book takes up more time than the other three combined yeah i think from what i could tell this one go i want to say because he's with the farmer or with the sheep herder for like a year, something mm -hmm. like close that. to it, yeah. So yeah, timeline wise, that. But for Terran, even growing up, you know, at best, what he's probably I don't remember if they say his age or not. He's probably like eighteen now, uh, at least. Yeah. 18, 18, yeah, like that's that's a that is a a wise and deep uh, resolution to come to over two kings, <laughs> right? Like that's a big thing. Like you could easily make friends with either one of these guys by just giving him a good an easy punishment type thing right right yeah kyle what about you anything jump out yeah i actually like the very my maybe the very first one um when he goes to the three witches to get the mm. what is it he's looking it's they send him off to go to the mirror but he wants the he just wants answers yeah he just wants answers um and i really liked the one the lesson from that but the way that it came about where he didn't have anything to bargain with, right? He's asking them to give him answers and they always have to take a price of something. So last time he had to give them his most prized possession and I can't remember exactly what, what that was that he gave them. Uh, but it was he, the, uh, the brooch. The brooch. Uh, a dance right. brooch. That's yeah. right. But he had nothing to bargain with this time or at least anything that they wanted. Oh, yeah. And I really liked the lesson that came out of that because he was basically saying, Whatever I get that is my heart's desire in the future, you can have that if you give me my answers. And they were just basically like, nah, <laughs> like we don't. You we... don't realize how bad that deal actually is, young it's, man. Exactly. And I mean, I just got done rewatching season one of The Witcher. That's exactly what I was just about to say. It, it very much was because I just watched that as well to get ready for season two. And it was absolutely the law of surprise. And that is such a high price to pay that he's unwittingly offering up. And I was actually surprised that they didn't take that offer being like thinking through like, OK, that could be very valuable to those witches. But they the lesson that was learned there was basically you can't bargain with what you don't have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what they said was usually that doesn't that doesn't have the retur return on investment for us. Um, which I thought was a really interesting and valuable lesson for him to learn that like, and again, it kind of comes full circle when, when he discovers who he is through all of his experiences, like those that has to be earned. And he, that was the shortcut he's trying to take up front is sure. I'll promise you my future or whatever it is. Give me that instant gratification of what I need now. Um, and that's not the way that life actually works right well, i'm wondering if they could like they looked at that and real and knew what his path was and said and realized that most of what he was gaining would not be something that, that he could actually legitimately give them because mm -hmm. i mean he's got skill sets but what are you gonna have him do weave you a, a wicker chair for your swamp <laughs> house like <laughs> I, I don't know i think that's uh, I, one side of it you can look at it and, like maybe they're not all bad or maybe they're kind of that neutral fate or whatever and they're mm -hmm. not gonna think do things or maybe they are bad like they're kind of the bad guys that we met earlier, mm -hmm. but they are realizing that it's not a good deal for them either. Right. In that sense. Yeah. It's, I mean, we kind of talked about this during the Black Cauldron discussion. Are, are the three witches bad? 
or are they just a force of nature mm -hmm. that you have to understand how to deal with? And I, I don't know the, the answer to that question, but uh, I thought uh, Lloyd Alexander did a great job of seeding that bit in the very first chapter. Like the first chapter is <laughs> incredibly fast. He leaves home and is in the marshes of Morva. The next paragraph. I know. I was um, I was surprised when I was like, did I? <laughs> Did I zone out for something and miss something? Because we right. were just in Caradal Bend, and now I'm like talking to the witches. What the heck? Yeah, this yeah. is definitely not uh, a modern doorstopper fantasy novel where you <laughs> read every step of the way. Um, no, but he did a great job seeding that that moment. Um, and and it's perfectly believable. Taryn wants answers. Hey, here are some very knowledgeable and powerful people in Perdain who can help me out. So, so he goes to them, right? Um, and then at the very end of the book, uh, after he's looked into the mirror and he's uh, back with Onla Clay Shaper and he's talking to him and he says, yeah, it was turns out it was just a, a puddle of water and I looked into it and it's not magic, but here's what I found out. Um, and he remarks on the fact that, um, in fact, I think a time or two before that, he he thinks of himself as a, a hen scratching it pebbles or I can't remember the, the exact language, but it's like, oh, my gosh, that was the phrase that Ordu used back in the marshes of morva um so anyway he gets to the end of his journey and has his grand realization his come to terran moment <laughs> and um what he realizes is that if there had existed this same object this pool magical you know quote-unquote magical pool in the marshes of morva and they said hey go over there and look in there it'll tell you what you want to know it wouldn't have worked but what worked is ordu said there's something called the Mirror of Lunette, and it's all the way on the other side of the freaking continent. Go there, uh, and it will give you what you want. Knowing, you know, she knowing that, like you said, Ryan, I mean, it's a cliche. It's especially a cliche for Sanderson people, but journey before destination and all that. It's the journey that's going to teach him who he is, not the damn mirror. Yeah. Um, and so, and he realizes that at the end, and, and it kind of, it casts the, the witches in a new light. Um, mm -hmm. and what they did for him. There's, we most of us at some point in time, by the time we're in our 30s, 40s, whatever, 20s, whatever, you've had some point in your life, something happened in your life where you just would not understand it without experiencing it. Yep. And you can be told all day long about it, but nothing will change the fact that you have to experience it. And that, I think, is the, the beauty of, of Taryn's journey here. And he comes to a great realization uh, with the when uh, I think it's right after the sheep herder reveals that he's not actually his father mm. and uh, or I, maybe it's right before. But Taryn basically realizes that he has to be OK with whatever the answer is, because if the only if he's only going to be OK with the answer of I'm royalty, then his journey doesn't mean anything like he's got to really come to terms with that. And uh, again, it's a very heavy lesson there. Um, but it's one of the more important ones that he realizes that he cannot go to the mirror and dictate what it's going to show him. It's It's got to be whatever the truth is. And that's the difference, uh, I think, for for a lot of us in our lives, like trying to figure out, am I driving to, uh, when you're trying to figure out who you are or your own whatever truth, whatever it is, are you are you going to be okay with what you find? Like, or are you... Are you only going to be satisfied if it is what you want it to be? Right. Because if you're only satisfied with what you want it to be, it's you're not going to get to where you want to be. It's uh, it, I I was again as an adult reading this book, just really disappointed in Taryn as a person mm -hmm. in that episode. I I hadn't really remembered what that what happened in the Craddock episode. His his fake father. Um, but the whole time he's there with Craddock, he can't help but think like, oh, well, here's my cage. I guess, I guess I'm just going to hate my life now. Um, and it, there is something to be said for Taryn, uh, accepting his duty. He says, if this mm -hmm. is my father, I have a duty to, uh, to help him, uh, to stay with him, to work the farm with him, whatever. Um, if he's not going to leave, then I have to stay. Um, and so there, like, it's not all bad, but at the same time, I'm like, dude, just because you're not, <laughs> just because you're not, you know, high king of all Perdane doesn't mean that you're not, you know, worth something. And and that's not how he sees it at that time in the yeah. story. Yeah, yeah, really brutal. 
Uh, Kyle, other thoughts, feelings, episodes? I mean, I was just thinking through what you were both talking about. That if, is the is the goal or is the journey to is it is the goal self acceptance or is the goal what you think the goal is, which is being quote unquote worthy to marry Alonwi? And mm. kind of we hit on that earlier, but you really aren't worthy to do that until you have achieved that self acceptance. To yeah. Ryan's point, whatever that truth is. So, I I mean, oh, I just made a connection actually. Uh, between this concept and uh, what he learns at the uh, the luck farm. I can't remember the guy's name or, you know, what the, the name of the place was, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. He goes to the farmstead, a bunch of kids, um, and this uh, this farmer, for lack of a better word, his entire life revolves around luck. And he puts out nets. And he's got, you know, fishing weirs and nets and all this stuff just to kind of catch what comes his way. And he'll use that. Um, and the lesson at the end of that is, uh, yeah, you can survive on luck alone if you're sharp enough to recognize something coming your way and make mm-hmm. use of it. And, you know, you, ha- you have to be smart and clever about it. But, yeah, you can rely on luck. Um, it's an interesting chapter and a very interesting lesson. But um, with what we were just talking about, uh, this idea that um, that you you don't get to choose everything that comes your way, but in a very Gandalfian way, you have to choose what to do with what's given to you. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so he, Taryn doesn't get to choose what his parentage is. And when he gets to Craddock's farm, as far as he's concerned, okay, now he's the son of a really poor farmer in this crappy plot of land. Well, you know, that's not what he was looking for, but it's what came his way. Um, and now he can he make his own luck out of it? Can he? Uh, I, I think he makes he learns the luck lesson later, mm-hmm. but they're uh, mm-hmm. they go together very nicely. Can and and I guess, man, I'm really struggling to make this point because I didn't write anything down on this beforehand. So I apologize for uh, rambling in this way. But it I guess it applies to us in that when it comes to opportunities, when it comes to luck, there's a lot to that. Um, Sometimes people don't make enough of it. Sometimes people make too much of the idea of luck and circumstance and all that. Um, but we all have different circumstances. We all have different things that come our way. Question is, what are you going to do with it? Um, are you going to play the victim uh, like Taryn did at, at Craddock's farm and say, well, gosh, I guess I'll just give in and have a crappy life. Oh, well. Goodbye, mm-hmm. Ilan Lee. Yeah. Or, or can you look at your situation and say, "All right, uh, here's where I am, and here's what I can do with it, and mm-hmm. and better your circumstances." And, you know, there's always some way to do that, right? And I think a sad reality is many of us squander the majority of those opportunities, whether we don't recognize them or we don't act on them or we give up on them too soon. Um. So I know it's it's interesting because, like I said, throughout this book, Taryn is given several opportunities to go this way or that way, take take this path or that path. Um, but ultimately, he doesn't give up on what he wants, which is self understanding. Well, he kind of does, doesn't he? For which, a while, well, I, I for a while, that was one does. of the most for interesting one of the most interesting parts of the book is when he finally says. Um, all right, no more quest. This hey, I I am Terran Wanderer. That's who I am. I'm just going to kind of wander until I stumble into what I want to do. Um, so he does kind of give up, doesn't he? Yeah, but I mean, but then I mean to to bring it back to the point, I I can't remember exactly what brings him back onto that path, but when that comes. He takes that moment after he's given up for a while. Yeah, it's when when Anla says uh, he says, "Oh, you should check out the mirror of Lunette." You know, and mm-hmm. Taryn's like, "What? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what that is?" So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I, I'm I'm fascinated by this idea of him having given up and what does that mean for the story and for him as a character. I don't know, Ryan. You look pensive. Do you have any thoughts? It's just re- it reminds me of a philosophical question that i both love and despise oh now i'm excited um that i learned from season one of heroes oh boy we're going back 
<laughs> we are going back in time. Um, Nathan Petrelli is speaking to the villain in that one, and he asks him, Nathan, do you want to have a life of happiness or a life of meaning and purpose? And he says, well, ideally, I'd like to have both. He goes, it's not possible. Because a man who wants a life of happiness can only ever be focused on the now, and a man who wants meaning can only ever be concerned about what's his past and his future. And I look at Taryn's journey and his moment of giving up and kind of basically deciding that I'm going to be, I'm going to just try and be happy with what I have now. There's no, uh, it's not until he finds he's that he's reminded of purpose that he decides to go the other way. And this, I, I think back on that little philosophy question of, are you, you know, are you aiming for happiness or are you aiming for purpose? Uh, can you have both? Can you not like it's, drives me absolutely insane uh, bounce back and forth every time and every time i talk to people about it there's some, some very vociferously have told me no that is a falsehood you should not listen to that at all and i'm like i it was on heroes i had to it's come it, on. yeah it, it was right there on tv i had I no choice but to believe it you can't trust your heroes who can you trust ryan <laughs> um all right so now the question is i think um how much more do we want to talk about this book uh, in its specifics? Or do we zoom back out and kind of uh, get ourselves to the, you know, the 30,000 foot view again on our way out of talking about this? Do you guys have any other specific things you want to get into? I mean, I don't feel like there's a whole lot more specifics that we can go unless we go into each of the individual trades that he went into of <laughs> pottery, weaving, <laughs> and uh, shoot, blacksmithing. Blacksmithing, thank yeah. you. I was like, it's the one he actually had a little bit of a knowledge about beforehand. That's where the uh, <laughs> forge and pounding joke came in. That's right. I just that I, I didn't want to think about anything to do with forging and pounding. So, <laughs> uh, no, I, I kind of, I do want to mention that earlier I said the uh, the Morta episode was the thing that stuck out, and the other one was the the three trades. Mm -hmm. um, I that really stuck out in my mind from my very first read. That's so interesting. And you get to this and it's all of one and a half chapters, you know, that he rips through three different trades. And, um, but it's, I, I do like them. I love that episode actually for what he learns at the end of each one. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, each, each, uh, master craftsman woman has a different outlook on what is life and, you know, how you think about life. Now, life is a forge. You're, you know, you, you're a hunk of metal and life pounds you into whatever shape it needs, you know, whatever you'll allow. Life is a loom and you have to understand, like, each day, each person is a thread and you have to understand the warp and the weft and the, um, and, the, you know, life is a, life is a clay pot. I don't know, whatever. Uh, life, life is a highway. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys want a, a good legendary tangent and then I'll come back to my point? Of course. Um, <laughs> of course. I used to play this game a lot uh, in my late teens called um, the Your Mom game. And you pick any song with a, a good like two syllable moment and just swap in Your Mom. So, for instance, I was uh, walking along with my friend one day and he started singing Life's a Highway. And I went, Your Mom's a Highway. And I want, never mind. <laughs> I'm out. Uh, we all died laughing. It was, uh, it was embarrassing, but fun. Uh, okay. So, thanks for that, Kyle. Sorry. And thus began and ended Craig's comedy career. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Um, where was I? The three, the three, the, three life trades. Lessons. the best life lesson that he learns in the three trades is uh, when he is with Onla Clay Shaper, the, the the guy working the the what, what do you call it? The Potter's wheel. The potter. Potter's wheel. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, he's working with the Potter, and he wants so badly to do this thing. He loves it. He loves the idea behind it. He loves, loves the feeling of it. He wants to be a potter, uh, but comes to the conclusion that, you know what? I'm kind of no good at this. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, boy, there are a lot of people who, including myself, who can use that lesson at different stages of their life where it's like, look, that is a, it, that is a great thing. It's a, it's a good desire. I, it, it's worthy uh, for you to want to do this thing, but you can't do it. And, and there goes the Air Force. I, I, I'm sure everybody can hear the jets. But you can't do that thing for whatever reason. The, mm -hmm. the, the talent, the gift passed over you. So sorry, but you're going to want to find something else. Um, and there are those who reject that and 
still try to make a go of it. There are those who don't ever recognize that and, you know, make entire careers out of sucking at something, you know, whatever. I don't know. I love that that bit. So, yes, Ryan, we will talk about the three <laughs> trades. OK, OK. No. All right. Um, anything else? No, no, I'm pretty sure we got it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, 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 got it covered. we got it covered. So this book, Kyle, is there anything in the book or anything about the book, the concept, the, the way it was written? We said a lot of positive stuff about this book. Is there anything from your perspective as a first time reader, as somebody who read it as an adult uh, that jumped out to you that you would criticize that you would think oh, you know, this could have been handled better or I wish he would have spent more time here, whatever? Um, structurally, not necessarily, uh, reading this book in 2021 for the first time and having read several other fantasy, more modern fantasy as well. The dialogue gets very, I get weary of the dialogue in the mm. old epic fantasy, you know, epic, the high fantasy, high language. fantasy language. Yeah. Uh, it bothers me a little bit just from, it's just not stylistically, not my, not my jam. So that's, that's my one criticism but it's not even really a criticism it's just more of a personal personal preference. taste yeah. yeah i that jumped out to me as well on this read i mean we've talked about the language in the previous books but it became i, I think he leaned into it even more yeah. in this book it did feel like he he was like oh we're gonna do this more yeah and i don't care for it i from my perspective i actually like it i mm -hmm. like it quite a bit now i have to acknowledge that some of that may be nostalgia you know sure. and I'm, I'm willing to put up with a certain amount of that because i love these books uh, so that that may be at play to a certain extent it, here, but uh, but I I genuinely enjoy uh, this idea of you know I'm reading a book that I understand it, life doesn't look like this mm -hmm. um, you know we, we don't all go traipsing through the mountains with our hairy you know shaggy companion whatever um, <laughs> well except for me when I go hiking with Ryan um, <laughs> but you know li life doesn't look like this. Uh, and because of that, I like the idea that it's it kind of feels dreamlike. It, it feels mm -hmm. different than real life. So sure, I but I, I don't begrudge you your aesthetic taste. Obviously, nah, it's just it's 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 too Shakespearean for my taste as far as the language mm. is concerned. That is, I get the same vibe where I'm like, all right, I feel like I have to self translate to get to what he actually wants to say. Sometimes, right? Yeah, I, I could see it being a little stilted. So Ryan, uh, what about you? Anything from your perspective that you would I, criticize? I have one question. It's not, again, it's not really a criticism, but it's a question of could we have learned the same lessons uh, with fewer variations, I guess? Because I feel like he goes through like nine different lessons or things like that to, to pick up through this whole thing. And they're all like each one of them is important to him figure out who he is and the sort of uh, person that he's going to be. But especially like to a more modern audience now, would it have been better to spend more time with one tradesman learning those lessons than to go through all three tradesmen? Right. That sort of thing. That's the only like I, I feel like maybe this is more saying that if it was written now, you probably would be better suited to spend more time and more depth with a character learning deep lessons than to just express lane these lessons through as fast <laughs> yeah. as possible with you know nine different mm -hmm. people yeah it's I, I think that's valid i think that's fair that's definitely something uh, again just speaking of aesthetics it's what we're used to now mm -hmm. um when we read a, a fantasy novel or you know just about any novel really you're going to spend more time marinating in certain things whereas mm -hmm. in this it's like now i've got something to say and here's the episode in which i say it now let's move on to the next thing i have to say mm -hmm. uh definitely a different vibe you do, gotta be careful do we get to leave behind assistant pig, pig keeper at this point now that he's discovered who he is <laughs> you don't like the assistant pig keeper thing uh it, <laughs> it was fine for the first book or even for the and, and i think especially with this where this is the journey of self-discovery of who he is mm -hmm. i think it still makes sense that as he's le as he's going on this journey, he sees himself as assistant pig keeper because that's not necessarily like the first book. It's almost given to him in jest, where it's like, "Oh, you you want you want a title, huh? you want a title, and you want to be self important." Okay, assistant pig keeper, and so it's it's lingered with him throughout the last several books, obviously. But at this point, now that Taryn knows who he is and has discovered himself, like 
we should be leaving that behind. Yeah. So I'm curious if we do. Uh, you will find out when we read The High King, book five of the Perdane Chronicles, coming up soon on the Legendarium. Um, I, I will say, uh, I, I asked you guys the question, what, you know, what do you find fault with? Um, and again, I'm just going to say, I understand nostalgia, grains of salt abound, okay? But I was thinking about this question, what, what did I not like? What did I, what would I change? What would I seek to improve if I were editing this book? I couldn't come up with a dang thing. I love this book. Mm -hmm. I love everything about it. Um, the, I, I do, I miss Ilanwi, I guess. It, you might, there's maybe something. I miss Ilanwi. There you go. I wish that she were in this story. It's been so, a long <laughs> year and a half, two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I think that this is, this is one of the most meaning packed books uh, that I've ever read. Like pound for pound, page for page. There's more life lessons packed into this book than I think maybe anything I've ever read. Um, I don't know. I, I, I open to correction on that. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying that this is the truth. I'm just saying. No, I, you I learned can't. 14 lessons when you read <laughs> Wax and Wayne. So there's no way this is it. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, I hope you guys liked it too. Mm -hmm. um, I hope everybody else enjoyed the book. If you are reading it for the first time, or if it's a reread for you as well, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we're almost done with this series. Uh, which means we'll be able to move on to the next thing. Um, I can't remember. I, I know I talked about this on like our Wheel of Time episodes, but I can't remember if I've talked about it in these episodes, what we're doing next. Um, Don't know if you have either. Um, we are, what, are we, what are we doing could next? It would be a reveal for me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, you and week. I talked about it, didn't we? Yeah. Um, we're going to be reading, we're finally doing the Silmarillion the way that it was meant to be done on the Legendarium. Uh, as in... Begrudgingly and... <laughs> Sarcastically. sarcastically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, uh, what I mean is uh, it's not necessarily chapter by chapter, literally, but chunk by chunk. Uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll be doing many episodes on the Silmarillion. Um, and then what was the other? Were we talking about doing? Uh, uh, oh, uh, Joe Abercrombie as well. Yeah, we're looking at First yeah. Law as probably the one following that. Maybe uh, Powder Mage. We, oh, that's right. Brian McClellan. Um, so, yeah, Joe Abercrombie and Brian McClellan are kind of on deck. Um, so we'll we'll sprinkle those in with some Tolkien episodes and, and see what happens. So hope you guys all uh, in, are enjoying these episodes. I hope you enjoy the ones coming up. And uh, make sure you go to thelegendarium.com and leave us comments on, uh, on Discord. I will say the episode discussion channel in Discord is the one that I pay the very most attention to, uh, aside from the patron channel. Uh, but I love that episode discussion channel. So yeah, I'd love to hear from everybody there. Uh, and you guys, I guess I'll see you next time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not turning this off yet. That was so. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just not. See you next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs>